Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to train leaders, develop community organising strategies and empower people to organise for change. And in 2021, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to make a difference, inspire, give hope and enable leadership to achieve their shared purpose. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Socially Democratic is also presented to you by... Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Are you passionate about building strong relationships and solving problems? Morris Blackburn, Australia's leading plaintiff law firm, is looking for two union relationship organisers in Queensland and in Melbourne. And your responsibilities will include providing an exceptional service to union members and union clients by connecting them to the best legal staff across Morris Blackburn's practice areas. The roles are based in Melbourne and in Queensland and to apply... Simply go to www.morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. I'll read that again. It's morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. Be part of the change and fight for fair. Apply now. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly center-left political and cultural podcast that dives into the progressive issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And we're going abroad again this week. Um, we are joined by Itai Flesher, who is the Jerusalem correspondent for Plus 61J Media. He's based in Jerusalem and he's been covering the Israeli elections that have been happening um, that were last week. Um, it feels like the poor old Israelis are going to the polls uh, quite a lot these days, um, but we're going to find out why that is the case um, and get uh, Itai's breakdown of the results from last week's elections and the prospects of all the different factions and their chances of forming government um, in Israel. So that is today's episode um, and I hope uh, you all enjoy that. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon and Stitcher and if you're an Apple podcast user leave us a rating and give us a review we really appreciate it and for all the updates follow Dunn Street on Facebook Twitter Instagram and LinkedIn okay let's get to today's episode we're taping this one on a glorious Wednesday afternoon in uh, sunny Melbourne um, and uh, the national elections were held in Israel last week and to help me unpack the complexities of Israeli politics is a former Melbourneian but now the Jerusalem correspondent for Plus 61J Media uh, where he has covered the past four elections in great detail and he's also the education director for uh, Kids for Peace Jerusalem which is an interfaith youth movement for Israelis and Palestinians. So it's great to have him on the show uh, today, Itay Flesher. Shalom, uh, happy Passover and welcome to Socially Democratic. Shalom, it's uh, great to be here um, and happy Pesach to all the listeners and uh, to everyone in Australia. Um, glad to be speaking with uh, friends back home. Now, um, we've got a bit to cover uh, today because um, Israeli elections can be reasonably complex, so we're going to try and step it out as we go. Um, but I think the very first question I'm going to ask you is, um, why is Israel having a new set of elections um, this March? It just felt like uh, it was only yesterday that you had an election and poor old Israelis are back at the polls again. Um, why is this the fourth time in two years that Israel's had a national election and what brought this election on in particular? Uh, so I'll go back to the first election because that's really the trigger for all four of them. And it has to do with the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, being on trial for bribery, fraud and breach of trust. Um, as, that, as that trial began, many people, both on the left and the right, felt it was inappropriate to have a Prime Minister who is you know, literally having to attend court and represent himself uh, and represent his innocence uh, on, these, on these alleged corruption cases. Um, saying that that's not appropriate to be prime minister. He obviously believes that these are trumped up charges that, um, that the, the media and the police and the courts are sort of out to get him. 
and uh, he feels like he shouldn't have to resign until he's proven guilty. And so what's happened is the country sort of, rather than the traditional split between left and right, which is how Israeli politics was really since the 1970s, where left meant you kind of supported a two-state solution and right meant you wanted to hold on to all of the um, land of Israel. Um, there's now been this split between what I call the, the, the Bibi camp, um, which is Bibi's Netanyahu's nickname, and the, uh, and the change camp. And, the, um, and so the last uh, four elections, actually, the change camp has won more seats than the Bibi camp. But the problem is that the change camp isn't able to, um, of the different parties in the change camp, there's about seven parties there, they can't choose who should be prime minister from that seven. Um, and that's why we keep going into these cycles of new elections. Um, and then specifically this election that we had now, the, the trigger for that was that in the last election, um, one of the opposition parties, Benny Gantz, decided to join the coalition, which was quite surprising to everyone because he sort of ran on this campaign of, I won't sit with Bibi, but he did join him. And, and one of the agreements that they had was that Netanyahu would be prime minister for two years and Gantz would be prime minister for two years as a power sharing agreement. But in reality, what happened was when it came time for Gantz to have his turn, mm -hmm. um, Netanyahu didn't pass the budget. And when you don't pass a budget, that automatically triggers a new election. So Netanyahu didn't, he didn't basically keep his side of the agreement with Gantz. And so that's why we had the, the fourth election. For those unfamiliar with the makeup of uh, political parties in Israel, um, it sometimes can be complicated to, to follow. Um, I feel like Isra Israeli party politics or factions as they're known can make uh, Australian student university politics look like a picnic. I remember when I was in NUS having to negotiate at a National Union of Students conference with all the different warring tribes was quite a complex matter um, and I actually wasn't bad at it and I feel like I'd be very good at Israeli politics off the back of that. Having said that though, um, let's do a sort of an Israeli politics 101 for the folks here in Australia. Um, I'm wondering if you can, how do we do this? Let's sort of talk about who the major factions are, where they sit on that left-right um, spectrum, and perhaps let's start with the centre-right uh, factions. Yeah. So in the, in the Israeli Knesset, there are 120 seats. The voting system is proportional representation. So think of the Australian Senate, but with no House of Representatives. So every proportion of votes you get equals a certain number of seats, depending on who's voting. It's not compulsory voting. Um, between 60 to 80% of the, of the population votes in most elections, which is quite high for a country that doesn't have compulsory voting. Um, so of the, in order to be prime minister, you need, to, you need the support of 61 out of the 120 seats in the Knesset. So in the last election, these are the parties that were elected. I'll just go by by the right first. Um, so the first is the Likud, which is led by Benjamin Netanyahu. They won 30 seats, but that was seven less than they won last time. And I'll, I'll talk about that, why they why they had that big drop. Then the next is the main opposition party, which is uh, Yesh Atid, led, led by, led by um, Yair Lapid. They won 17 seats. Um, and they are a lot more of a, um, I, I guess, a, a, a more secular, um, more sort of pro-gay rights, more um, in favour of um, a, a clean government, you know, they say, you know, against corruption, those sorts of things. Um, then the next party, I'm just going in order of size, sorry, not not in order of um, left and right, because it's too complicated to do left and right. Um, then the next one is Shas, um, which is a, a party that represents uh, Jews who immigrated to Israel from Arab countries mainly, so countries like Morocco, Yemen, Iraq, Egypt, um, and also Jews with traditional religious values. Um, they won nine seats. Then there's the Blue and White Party led by Benny Gantz. Benny Gantz is a former IDF chief of staff. And the Blue and White, similar to Yesh Atid, um, they're actually part of the same bloc before. They represent, um, you know, having term limits for, for the Israeli government and um, you know, ma mainly centrist policies. They sort of want to try and work with everyone. Um, Yamina is the party of Naftali Bennett. Um, they're a right-wing party. Yamina literally means right in, in Hebrew. Um, so they want to see, they're, they're very neoliberal in their economic view. You know, Naftali Bennett ran on a big campaign to turn Israel's economy into uh, Singapore. 
So in that sense, they probably have a lot in common with the with the Liberal Party of Australia in terms of wanting to be um, sort of lower taxing um, and want to sort of uh, give give businesses um, more more free reign to do what they want with their money, um, and also very much in favour of annexation of the of the West Bank in terms of their right wing policies towards the the Palestinians. Then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the Labor Party led by Mirav Mikhaeli, who did an amazing job of taking them from zero seats in polls uh, a few months ago to seven seats. Um, and their economic policy is um, a lot more, uh, you know, government intervention, support for unions, support for workers' rights, gay rights, climate change, those sorts of issues. Um, then you have the United Torah Judaism Party led by Moshe Gafni with seven seats. They're, they're an ultra-Orthodox party similar to Shas who want to see um, the, the various religious laws of Israel's to do with the day of rest being Shabbat, um, to do with army service um, and funding for ultra-Orthodox institutions to be supported. Then you have Yisrael Beitenu, led by Avigdor Lieberman. Um, this party used to represent mainly Jews from the former Soviet Union who uh, moved to Israel in the last... Uh, two decades, they're very, very anti the Haredi or the ultra-Orthodox parties because they believe that there should be a separation of religion and state in Israel and that uh, secular people should have um, more rights to do what they want to do, whether it be um, on Shabbat, whether it be what they eat, whether it be how they marry, how they get divorced, that sort of thing. Then the next party, this is probably the most controversial of all the parties. I think mean, this one makes one nation look like moderates. Um, they're called the uh, Religious Zionist Party, led by Vitalis Smotrich. Um, this is a very hard right uh, party that um, believes that there should be a loyalty oath um, for Arabs. So if Arabs don't declare loyalty to Israel, they shouldn't be able to be citizens in the country. They want to annex all of the settlements in the West Bank. They, they're totally against gay pride marches. Um, and support reparative therapy, so therapy that converts gay people um, to be straight. They're very much in favour of, um, like some of their ads even talked about, like, you know, like Republican style gun rights, you know, like everyone should have a gun in their house to be able to, you know, protect themselves against um, intruders. Um, they will not sit with any Arab uh, member of parliament. They're also very anti-Islam, you know, their leader, Vitalis Smotrich made those claims. The number three on their list, um, a, a man named Itamar Ben-Gvir, um, is, is a follower of Rabbi Mary Kahana. He was a man who was, um, he was assassinated in New York, but he, he, he believed in, uh, in Jewish terrorism, in, in sort of revenge attacks. So whenever there's an Arab attack against Jews, he believed that Jews should take revenge and commit a, an attack against um, an innocent Arab person. The next party is the joint list led by Ayman Order. They had a big drop from um, 15 seats in the last election down to six. Um, that was mainly due to Arab voter turnout um, being significantly lower than it was before. Um, and Ayman Order is from the Israeli Communist Party, Hadash, um, and they believe in that their main issue is, is the issue of gun violence in Arab communities, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. Um, and also um, representation for, um, for the Arab Israelis in terms of issues like the Jewish nation state law and equality and funding for health and education. Then you've got the New Hope Party with Gidon Saar, who won six seats. Um, they are a breakaway from the Likud. Their policies are almost identical to the Likud, but the main reason they broke away is they don't believe Netanyahu should be prime minister while he is on trial and they want to their, their key issues was installing term limits for Israeli prime ministers you can only be in power for eight years um, and also having a, a, a sort of a more respectable right-wing government um, that's less smired with corruption. Then two more parties to go we have Merit which is a bit like the Greens um, so quite probably the most left-wing of the Jewish parties very strong on gay rights climate change asylum seeker rights um, favour a more socialist economy, um, also have an equal in their top four, equal Jewish and Arab representation. Um, and they they did very well with, with six seats. Uh, a lot of people were, were expecting them to get wiped out. So they sort of surprised the pollsters in that regard. And then the last party is the Ram Party led by 
um, Mansour Abbas, who is the head of the southern branch of the Islamic movement uh, in Israel, which is part of the Muslim Brotherhood. And they are a religious Muslim party. Um, and they, um, so a lot of their issues are similar to the joint list. Um, but one of the key differences between them and the joint list is they are willing to sit either with a right or a left wing coalition. Do you remember all of that? <laughs> I did. Um, that's a uh, fantastic effort to set the scene for the parties um, in Israel. Um, you could do with a couple more, though, I reckon. Um, the There are four and a half million voters in Israel, but sometimes it feels like there's four and a half million political parties and growing. Do you think, yeah, totally. do you think your de- the democracy could do with a little less plural, 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 plurality in terms of its party device, diversity? And the fact that they keep on splitting, I, I, I just wonder if that's not hindering the ability to form government. Look, on the one hand, the, some would say the government, this system is too democratic because what you do is you give, you give a voice to a very small party in a very, I, I remember when One Nation once got like 10% of the vote in Australia and it won one seat um, because, because of the, uh, the preference system in Australia, what happens is small parties very rarely win seats in the lower house. Um, and in a way it's a good system because the small party gets its vote expressed through the preference system. Whereas in Israel, because you, you, you don't, there's no preference system, you just vote for a party. Yeah. And so if your party doesn't cross a threshold, the vote is wasted. And if your party's in, then your party acts for the people that voted for that party. So there's no, there's no, there's no preferencing the larger parties. And so what happened in this election is actually the, the, the bigger parties in the middle, the Yeshatid and the Likud party, the Blue and White party, all of them lost votes from the last election. And the more, I'd say, extreme um, parties, the more ideological parties, they, um, they did much better. Um, I think because people, maybe we'll talk about Corona in a minute, but uh, I think people were looking for something more ideological in in this election. Well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about COVID and uh, coronavirus. Um, I've as as an outsider looking in, I've always assumed that security would have been um, one of the major issues that would be. Um, in the forefront of voters as they went into the polls to vote um, over, you know, possibly through the life of the history of the state, but certainly from um, the early 2000s uh, onwards. Um, What were the issues that dominated um, the the political debate heading into um, this particular campaign Um, and what role did COVID and the handling of COVID and the perception of the Netanyahu government's ability to handle COVID uh, play into the conversation. Yeah. I was just saying in Israel, everyone calls it Corona, even though it's not the correct name for the virus. So I'm just going to call it that just to, to keep, keep in sync with uh, what they do here in Israel. So yeah, Corona was definitely a big issue. Um, I'll give you the two arguments. So the first argument is that Netanyahu handled it really badly um, because we had over 6,000 people dead. The airport wasn't closed for, for most of the time, meaning a lot of variants from different countries came. The quarantine system wasn't done well, so you could quarantine at home. A lot of people left their home while they were meant to be in quarantine. Um, a lot of ministers themselves didn't follow social distancing rules. So, you know, at times when we were told, you know, don't have more than five people in your house, the ministers were having birthday parties and dinner parties, and this was leaked on social media. Um, there was also in, in, inadequate funding for hospitals that were very strained. Um, and there were there were certain groups in society when they didn't follow the rules, that they were sit, sit seemingly given a green light. Um, for example, when my kids' schools were closed in Jerusalem, there were other schools that were open. And a lot of people were saying, well, if you're shutting down all the schools, well, you can't let some schools remain open and some not, depending on if they have representatives in your in your coalition or not. So that's the sort of argument that against Netanyahu. The argument for Netanyahu is that Israel's currently leading the world in in vaccinations. Um, I was vaccinated on the 1st of January already. Um, My first shot was Pfizer and the second one three weeks later. Um, So with with the majority of the country now vaccinated, um, we have today one of the lowest um, cases, cases per day, I think in nine months now. 
all the restaurants are open again, schools are open again, people are in the markets, you know, everything has come back to life. They're talking about getting rid of masks even in the, in the next month or two. So there's a real sense of, um, of like Netanyahu's advocacy for vaccines and getting them one of the first in the world is, is what enabled us to, to be able to enjoy the freedoms we have now. So, so it really depends on what you want to look at. If you want to look at the management of Corona, then you, you would vote against Netanyahu. If you want to look at the, at the vaccines, then you would, then you might vote for him. And then there was also um, the recent uh, peace agreements with uh, the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco, and there's one being negotiated with Sudan as well. So, so, so some people feel like that Netanyahu deserves credit for that. So let's say that was the first issue and how people voted, depending on how they see the management of Corona. The second issue to relate to the first issue is to do with how you feel about the ultra-Orthodox. The ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel are about 10% of the population, um, but there was a lot of um, divisions around the way they related to Corona and how they did or didn't social distance at various times. And if you, um, if you feel like you don't like them, and there's a lot of parties that were running very strong anti-ultra-orthodox campaigns. And if you feel like you were, you you know, you had sympathy with the struggles that they faced around Corona, especially they live in large areas where it's very hard to social distance in large families, then you voted for parties that like either the ultra-orthodox parties or parties that support them like Likud. And then the last issue is, um, and this was the issue all, all four elections, is Netanyahu's trial. Um, whether you believe, not whether you believe he's innocent or guilty, because I guess we don't know that, but it's whether you believe a, a sitting prime minister should be in office whilst he's on trial. Um, the argument against is that leaving him in office while he's on trial will allow, will mean that he'll make decisions that will be suitable to his case um, rather than in the interests of the people. Specifically, Netanyahu was trying to get this immunity law, which is a law that would say a sitting prime minister cannot face trial while in office. Um, and if that law is passed, then that obviously damages democracy in a very serious way and it damages the status. He wants to weaken the Supreme Court, weaken the police. Um, you know, he wants to choose his own police commissioner who will be investigating him and, you know, all, all the sorts of things that um, shouldn't happen in a democracy. That's the argument against Netanyahu. The argument for Netanyahu is basically innocent until proven guilty. You know, he hasn't been found guilty yet. He says that these charges um, are, are all just, you know, made up by the opposition. There's no evidence for them, um, even though we obviously have tape recordings of a lot of things. He's accused from, I won't go into all the details of the investigations, but he, he argues that, um, that he's, been, he's the victim of a hit job and he shouldn't have to resign until he's proven guilty. And so it really depends on what you feel will, will depend on whether you vote for parties that are in the pro-Netanyahu camp or in the change camp. Um, innocent, um, innocent until proven guilty. He's certainly not behaving like an innocent man the way that he's trying to um, weaken the levers that hold him accountable mm -hmm. in public office. I want to turn to the two centre-left parties um, that um, you spoke about in the very thorough rundown of all the parties and how they went in the most recent elections, and that's um, Labor and um, Moretz. Um, Labor, under the new leadership of um, Mirov Mikhali, um, as you said, uh, picked up uh, seven seats, um, which was a great result. And reading in the papers in the weeks leading up to the election, there was a lot of predictions that both um, the, the, the Labor Party and Moretz would just be wiped out. Um, and by the sounds of it, from what you're saying, you know, Moretz had a great result as well. And so the two parties, you know, co co collectively comprise of 13 um, MKs now in the Knesset. Um, turning to Labor first of all, um, the the leadership of the election of Macaulay, what, what role did that play, do you think, in Labor's ability to have a bit of a bounce back? Um, yeah, and so also Moretz, where did, where, did, where, where did we see an increase in their support as well? Right. So um, is it, there's a really interesting lesson here for campaigners in Australia. So if, you, if you're a campaigner, take notes for this answer. Labor and Merits ran together last election and got seven seats. And this time they ran separately and combined and won 13 seats. So um, it really, I think there's a message here, firstly, that people prefer to have more people want to vote for an ideological party 
that stands for something than sort of two parties that have compromised to sort of come together but don't don't really have a clear ideology. So that's one lesson. I think the next lesson is Merav Mikhaili was the only party that ran a positive campaign. And what I mean by that is every single party, most of their ads were, this party is horrible, so vote for us. This party is going to take this right away and we'll, pro we'll, we'll protect this right. And Merav didn't attack any parties in any of her ads. Um, and then she was the only party that did that. But the next thing that she did, I think it was really good, is um, she was the only party led by a woman, uh, the Labor Party. And so she very much ran on the, the women's leadership. Uh, we need women in politics. Um, that kind of reminded me a bit of the Hillary Clinton campaign in that sense, in, in the sense of her messaging, especially around security issues. You know, a lot of the security cabinet is voted by men and army generals and that sort of thing. And she's been on the security cabinet herself for many years. And, and so she was basically saying, I have something to say about Iran. I have something to say about Gaza, about Hamas, about all of these sorts of things. And security shouldn't just be a, a discussion that where only men have things to say about, about peace and security. Um, they ran a lot on, on social issues to do with um, family leave, um, parental leave, um, workers' rights, unions, pay. You know, sort of, we have over a million unemployed people from Corona, so obviously that was that was a big issue. Um, and then also the standard left-wing issues, climate change, LGBT rights, um, those sorts of things. Um, in terms of the Merits Party, so they they ran quite a negative campaign, I'd say, on two issues. One was if we don't get in, Netanyahu gets 61. That was their that was their big thing. Um, and then their other big thing was really a lot of their ads were focused at, on this far right party, this uh, Kahanas, the uh, party led by Itamar Ben Gur, that was part of the religious Zionism bloc, and they were basically saying. If these guys get in, we're going to be the ones who fight them. Like we're going to be the voice against fascism, against racism, and against that sort of thing. Um, and then they also ran on the traditional left-wing issues that they always run on against the occupation. Um, they they also made quite a controversial statement about the ICC, which got a lot of attention um, during the election campaign. The the International Criminal Court said that it should open investigations into the way that Israel um, responded to rocket attacks from Gaza um, in the 2014 Gaza war and also Israel's building of settlements in the West Bank. And there was wall-to-wall -wall condemnation of the ICC by almost every Israeli political party saying Israel's a democracy, we don't need the ICC to investigate us, we can investigate us ourselves. And Meretz was the only Zionist party that came out and said, you know what, maybe maybe the ICC have a point, maybe we're not investigating ourselves well enough and, and there is something to look into here and um, and and we do maybe use disproportionate force in Gaza and definitely the building of settlements is something we shouldn't do. And, and them sort of, I guess, lending some sort of legitimacy to the, to the ICC um, got them a lot of attention, probably, again, picked up some votes from the more radical left um, in, in, within the Jewish um, Israelis and, and also some votes from Arab Israelis as well, but will make it very hard for the more right-wing parties now to sit with them because they're seen as a party that's critical of the IDF and the IDF is like this sort of sacrosanct army that uh, generally, you know, people don't criticise, um, for, for most of the Zionist parties don't, don't criticise the IDF, especially in the way they treat Palestinians. It's not, it's not really a done thing. Rallies voted for the religious Zionist party. And you spoke in a bit of detail when you did sort of ran through the um, ran through the factions at the start of the program about who they are. I'm just wondering, what does this say about a section of this of the community that would then go out and support such a political party? I, I want to speak two things about this party. Firstly, about their name. The majority of religious Zionists didn't vote for them. Um, the majority of religious Zionists vote for Yamina, Likud, Blue and White. You know, various other parties. So a lot of religious Zionists actually feel quite upset that they've taken the name of what is, I guess, a type of Jewish religious national identification and turned it into the name of a political party, when the majority of their votes probably come from, uh, obviously, both religious Zionists, but also ultra-Orthodox Jews as well. So that's one thing. I think it's a, it's a problematic naming of a party. But I think, yeah, I think it's very concerning that um, that that this party that 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 includes, you know, really homophobes and racists and and people that just don't see a place 
in this country for um, for people that don't don't think the way they do. It's a very intolerant party. Um, and yeah, I feel very sad and that a party like that was not just elected by it, but elected by 190,000 votes. And um, I think it's it really, it really poses a real challenge. Um, you know, this party basically stands for Jewish supremacism. Like they, they don't, they don't really um, support, you know, any, any types of legislation that work on making this country more equal. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's very problematic. And, and especially Itamar Ben Gvir, the number three. You know, he until a year ago we had a picture of a terrorist on the wall of his house. This was a man who massacred 29 Muslims while they were praying um, in the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron in 1994. And he, he viewed this guy as a hero. You know, someone that committed mass murder. And then he, he took the picture down off his wall. But he he still you know, he still, as a lawyer, he still defends Jews who commit these price tag attacks when they go and like burn mosques and, um, and, and, uh, you know, slash car tires and, and throw rocks at Palestinians and, you know, these, these sorts of things. And, you know, he's their, he's their advocate. And so to have him in the Knesset is, is very troubling. Ordinary stuff. Uh, turnout for this election was around 67%. You mentioned before sort of the the historical numbers that have always been reasonably high in Israeli elections. Um, it was at 67% at the most recent poll, which was down from 71 in the last election in 2020. Uh, which particular factions struggled to turn out their base and and, uh, and why? So the, the two parties that really struggled were Likud and the joint list. Um, I'll start with the joint list. Um, that's the party that mainly represents Arab Israelis. So they struggled for two reasons. One, um, there was a lot of disappointment with how they used the 15 seats they won in the last election, the fact that they'd broken up into two factions, the fact that they weren't included in um, in a coalition and just couldn't weren't able to advocate well for the issues that they stood for. There, there was a there's a it's not true, but there's a perception that they that they're not effective um, MKs in in the Knesset um, because they can't get a lot of the bills that they want um, passed. And the Likud um, also lost a lot of votes, I think primarily to either the Giron Sars party um, and also to, um, I think, just election fatigue. You know, a lot of people blame Netanyahu for, for the reason why we're having this endless cycle of elections and also could be unemployed, could have had their business closed, all, all those sorts of reasons that would say, look, I, you know, I might be right wing, but I can't support you anymore after the way you managed Corona. So that, that I'd say they, they were the two main issues that would have brought the voter turnout down because they could have 300,000 less votes this time than, than last time. So since no faction was able to win the required 61 seats in the Knesset to form government, the task of then finding friends and other factions to form government begins. How long do the parties have to um, be able to coalesce the required 61 MKs to form government? So what will happen is on the 5th of April, every party meets with the president, Ruby Rivlin, and they have to give a recommendation for who they should be, who should be the prime minister. Um, and then the, the, the person that gets the most recommendations then gets uh, 30 days to form a coalition. Sometimes they can get an extension of an extra couple of weeks. If they can't form a coalition, then it can go back to the president and he can give the mandate to someone else. Um, and then they can get an extension as well. So you can have, it can go for about two or three months of negotiations until, until basically the clock runs out. And then, um, yeah, and then you go to fifth elections if you don't if you don't have someone by then. So let's talk about the math then. You talked about the pro Netanyahu and the anti Netanyahu blocks. Um, how many votes have do you peg the pro Netanyahu uh, block have at this very moment, and what do they need to do to what is their path to getting to the sixty one required? So the 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 pro Netanyahu block is on fifty two. Um, but if you include the Yamina party, which I think is almost certain to join them, it brings them up to uh, 59. And the anti-Netanyahu bloc, which is led by Lapid at the moment, is on 57. Uh, if you include the Ram party, it gets them up to 61. So um, the, the two sort of swing parties at the moment are Yamina and the Ram party, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and it's really who those two parties go with will determine uh, the next prime minister. 
So the uh, the Ram uh, Party, which is led by uh, Mansour Abbas, um, they um, can be looked at as, and, and Yamina as well, looked at as potential kingmakers here in this scenario. Mm, very um, much so. How realistic do you think um, it would be for either the Netanyahu bloc or the anti-Netanyahu bloc to be able to take in the Ram Party to form government? I mean, that's that's historic, isn't it, for that to occur? Yeah, so the Ram Party, as I mentioned, represents the, the Muslim Brotherhood. It's the southern faction of the of the Islamic movement in Israel. You've got to remember the northern faction of the Islamic movement in Israel doesn't believe in voting even. Like, they believe that you shouldn't engage in Israeli politics at all, um, and, uh, you know, they support Hamas as well. Um, the southern branch, of, of, you know, they do believe that um, basically that they would read the Quran and the teachings of Islam as saying that, you know, one should be a part of whatever system one is in in order to advocate for change for the, the issues that you believe in. So, so they're a lot, lot more sort of pragmatic. Um, there's a lot of concerns on with both sides of, of taking in Mansour Abbas. On the left, their hesitations with him is that he has very conservative views on LGBT issues. Um, you know, he's... Whilst he doesn't support polygamy, you know, there there are some members, former members of the Ram Party that had uh, multiple wives. Um, there's also an issue um, in terms of, 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 of on the left um, of the left bloc would need to have some right wing parties that would be uncomfortable with him. Then on the on the right. Um, so while some of the right wing parties might be OK with his stance on LGBT issues, they, their main concern would be that if let's say Israel was at war with um, with Hamas again, which you know, could, could happen, and then the government is relying on his votes, um, you know, to, to stay in office. Well, whilst whilst you don't need the Knesset doesn't approve military operations, but um, if 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 there was an attack on Gaza and then Rum would be under a lot of pressure to um, to bring down the government, they could. Um, and so there, there was a, there, there'd be a fear that they could, um, you know, as long as there's no security issue going on, that could be fine. But as soon as something happened, then then they could bring down the government. A right wing government could be brought down by <laughs> something connected to the to the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and the right wouldn't want that. So, so that's that, that's the main issue with Ram. But I think the reason they've become the kingmaker is that they've said kind of we're willing to sit with either side, and so that's why everyone's. You know, I'm sure Matura but is going to have a lot of people visiting him for iftar meals this uh, this Ramadan. The other thing that's important to note is we're recording this on Wednesday. On Thursday night, Israel time, Mansour Abbas is going to make a major speech in Hebrew um, where he's going to give his sort of I believe. Um, and the whole point of this speech, I'm sure we broadcast live on all the networks, is to in a way to speak to Jewish Israelis like the Ram Party has never, ever spoken before. And to say, don't be afraid of me. I want to be a partner. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what he's going to say in this speech, but I think the way it's received will could potentially be um, a big game changer, or people could just see it as as political spin. You've got to remember that the Ram Party, all their campaigning is in Arabic. Um, Mansour Abbas didn't do a single interview to any Hebrew language media, even though Hebrew is the language that most Jewish Israelis speak. You know, so. So most Jewish Israelis know nothing about this party um, beyond, you know, what they've heard other people say about it. They've never heard from his own mouth what he has to say, what he believes, what are the policies he wants, those sorts of things. So I think this this speech could be, you could potentially be a big game changer both on the right and the left if he can say things that make people feel comfortable with with having Ram in their coalition. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. What do you think that he needs to do to, if you're looking at the anti-Netanyahu bloc, what does he need to do to make uh, those on the left a little bit more comfortable with some of the problems that they've got him, particularly around social issues? So one of the things he said was, obviously gay rights is a big issue for, for, for many of the parties on the left, Merits, Labour, Yeshatid especially. So they could, when you're in a coalition, there's something called coalition discipline, which means that everyone has to vote for everyone else's bills in the coalition. Um, because if not everyone vote for everyone's bills, then they don't get passed. So, but what happens is sometimes on certain issues, you can you can say that you're allowed on these issues a conscience vote, and you don't have to follow coalition discipline. So, one of the things they could say is, 
look, we're still going to advance these various bills, but we'll give you a conscience vote so you don't have to vote against your beliefs on, on things that you don't want to. Um, I don't know if he'll be amenable to that, but that, that could be a strategy the left could, could try offering him. Um, Neftali Bennett from Yamina, just tell me a bit. I, I, when I was over in Israel for a, um, a political a Labor Party sort of political trip um, a couple of years ago, and we were in the Knesset, we he just walked past us, um, and he seemed like a larger than life kind of character. And he knew someone in the group and said, "Oh, you guys are from Australia. You know, j- jump in and have a photo." Like he just sort of photo bombed us without us even knowing, and then kind of then disappeared again. Um, yeah. what's, I read some of the reports in the media, um, in Israel talking about the, the outside chance, the smoky, he's the smoky chance that he could become prime minister. What's your thoughts on that? Look, he only won seven seats. Um, so to have a prime minister that won seven out of 120 seats would be, I think for a lot of Israelis on planet quite bizarre, but it's, yeah, I wouldn't rule it out. It definitely is possible because of the weird election maths that we, that we have at the moment. Um, I, I think he definitely wants to be prime minister. I mean, he said the whole campaign that he, he wasn't supporting either bloc and he, he, view, he viewed himself as a prime minister or candidate. He, his parents are originally from San Francisco. He speaks English fluently. Um, he definitely, you know, appears often on, on CNN and international channels defending um, Israel. When, when we were in our fourth lockdown and we had like millions of people unemployed and 10,000 new cases a day, you know, his party in the polls was sitting on up to 17, 18 seats. You know, a lot of people were, because, because the whole campaign, he mainly talked about Corona and saying, I can manage this much better than Netanyahu. And so I think, I think a lot of his support came not for his necessarily for his right wing positions, but for his, his, the sense that he had this perception of being a clean manager, a uh, a person that knows how to deal with problems. He, you know, he previously he came from a career in high tech where he made an exit with, with millions of dollars. So he's seen as, you know, a successful businessman, entrepreneur, that sort of thing, his economic plan as well, you know, compared to Israel to Singapore and that sort of thing. So I definitely think there there is support, but I think that because he comes from a party that's even more right wing than Netanyahu, I think I think a lot of people have question marks over him saying, you know, Corona is going to end at a certain point. And then what what are you going to do regarding Israel's treatment of the Palestinians, the two-state solution, you know, all of these sorts of things. Um, and I think that's where question marks would arise in terms of how how much support he has. Uh, you know, it would, be, it would have been interesting to see what happened if there was an election three months ago, but I, I still feel like someone like Naftali Bennett has a sort of cap of about 10 seats. I, I can't really ever see him winning more than that. Um, being in the kind of ideological right-wing party that he is now. The you mentioned uh, the leader of uh, uh, Yesh Atid, uh, Yal Lapid, who um, is seen as the, the the natural leader of the anti-Netanyahu bloc, and you made remarks to that just before. I have read a bit of commentary, to sort of questioning who is going to come out of that bloc to be the 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 person who will um, seek the prime ministership. Um, is it a foregone conclusion or is there a bit of debate about the leadership coming out of that block? Uh, yeah, that block could be led by Lapid. That's the most likely. It could also be led by Giron Saar or Naftali Bennett or even Benny Gantz. I'd say all of them are possibilities. Um, Benny Gantz, actually, interestingly, on November 21st, Benny Gantz becomes prime minister uh, because of the rotation agreement that was signed by Net- like if there isn't a new prime minister sworn in before November 21st, that then Benny Gantz automatically becomes prime minister. So there are some people talking about him being sort of a compromise candidate, given that he's sort of got that date coming anyway, that they might allow him to be prime minister for six months as a transition government. Um, and then they can sort of pass various legislation around the economy, you know, getting people back to work around, um, appointing a justice minister, stuff to do with the Supreme Court, these sort of things, and then call another election in six months from now. But at least you've got this transition government led by Gantz that could stable stabilise things, get Netanyahu out of Balfour Street. Um, and that's an option. I, I just don't think they have the numbers for it, but that I know that's an idea that's been floated. 
Um, before we turn attention to some sort of historical questions I've got for you about the Labor Party, I mean, the majority of the people that listen to this show are Australian Labor Party members or certainly supporters. Um, but one more question, just sort of in a prediction, where do you see this playing out? Who do you think is going to be successful in actually forming government? So I actually, I prepared this question. I've, I've written five options and I'm going to go from least likely to most likely. Right. Okay, so, so pay attention. So what I think is the least likely option is a Lapid-led government um, with 61 seats that includes both the Arab parties and the left-wing parties and New Hope. Um, I just think there'll be too much there to disagree on regarding both religion issues and um, and and the New Hope sitting with the joint list, I think is very unlikely, but that's, that's the least option. The next least likely option is Bennett um, leading the government with some of the centre-left parties and the ultra-Orthodox parties. Um, this was proposed by Tal Schneider, who's a political journalist. That would have 61 seats, but it would mean prying away Shas and United Torah Judaism from the, the arms of Likud, which would be very, very hard to do, but they do have 61. The third option is um, that either side convinces three MKs from the other bloc to move to their bloc. Um, that did happen last time, you know, uh, Netanyahu convinced 15 MKs from blue and white to join the, the Netanyahu bloc. So if, if either Netanyahu or Lapid convinced three MKs to leave their party and form, you know, act as independents, basically supporting the other bloc in exchange for ministries or legislation on their pet issues, that could potentially happen. Although parties that did that last time were punished in a big way in the poll. So I wouldn't, I don't think it's good for your political career to do that, but that, that could happen. The, the, the uh, an option that I think is of these sort of the second most likely is that Netanyahu forms a minority government of 59 with external support from RAM, that we, which would mean that they wouldn't be part of the government in terms of they wouldn't get ministers and, and that sort of thing, but they they wouldn't block supply or, or vote for no confidence motions, which would allow the government to operate, or operate as a minority. Um, and then the hope would be that once they were operating as a minority government for a few months, other opposition parties would then join them. And the most likely option, I think, of the five is that we go to fifth election. <laughs> <laughs> By far the most likely. I know, I'm sorry that to, to be the bearer of bad news, but of those options, I think, I think fifth elections is most likely. I was really looking forward to the fifth option. I can't believe it's going to be another bloody election. Um, to the second uh, option there, if you're an Ar Arab Israeli, how do you feel about your leader uh, entering into a, not a coalition, but certainly providing supply to Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud? So there's, there's an issue I haven't talked about yet, which is the issue of gun violence. In the past year, there's been over 100 people have been murdered um, in w what I would call is Either, either gang violence or just individuals killing other individuals because they owe them money or because of family disputes or these sorts of issues. It's almost entirely happening in Arab communities. Um, and the government's doing very little about this, not collecting the illegal weapons. Um, there's a perception there's not enough police stations there. And a lot of people are just, you know, because you can just be in the wrong place at the wrong time and there's a shootout in the street and, you know, children are being killed, women, you know, and so a lot of people who voted for Rahm are saying, look, this is a crisis situation. Like we need, we need police, we need law and order. We need, um, we need to, we need social programs to, to get, you know, people who are on the streets to get them busy. We need reforms to the banking system. So people don't have to take out loans on the black market, which, you know, has this whole cycle of debt and revenge and, you know, and there's various policies to deal with the, with the gun violence. And so, I think the people who voted for Ram are saying, look, we don't love Netanyahu. We definitely want, don't want to sit in a coalition with Smotrich and Ben Gvir and all these people, but we're in a crisis situation now and we need to get stuff done. And if getting stuff done means sitting with Netanyahu, then we'll hold our noses and do it. Um, and I think I think that's a, that's a key issue. And the other one is, especially because, you know, close to half of the votes for the Ram party come from the Negev. And you've got there a situation where you've got... Um, a number of unrecognized communities that belong to, to Bedouin Israelis. Um, we're talking about here, there's there's 46 villages in, in the Negev, but 35 of them are unrecognized. That means 60 to 70,000 people 
are living there. Most of them live under the poverty line. These villages are not connected to water, electricity, um, don't get basic services. So a lot of them would want these villages to be recognised under, under any sort of coalition agreement. Um, if you remember, I don't know, in 2015, there was this whole issue in, in WA where, where Tony Abbott said um, that he didn't want to subsidise and lifestyle choices of Aboriginal people who lived in these remote communities uh, in the Kimberley. And there was a huge wave of protest uh, in Melbourne and Sydney about this issue. And then eventually those remote Aboriginal communities were allowed to stay. Um, and I think Rama kind of looking at, at this time and saying, look, these unrecognised villages can't, they can't continue like that. Like they've got to be put on the grid and connected to water, electricity. If we can't, they're, they don't want their houses to be demolished anymore. You know, a lot of them have been living in these places for 50, 60 years already. And so um, and so I think that's also, that's another reason why they'll say we, we might compromise with Netanyahu because that can get us this thing that we've been sort of blocked trying to get for, for a very long time. Turning to um, Israeli labour politics and the history and where the, the place that the party finds itself in now, I mean, you think about the history of modern, the, the, the modern state of Israel, it is entwined with the history of the Israeli Labour Party and the, and the labour movement and kibbutzism. Um, you, know, I, 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 you know, it's always been put to me that people looked to the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, as the, you know, the future socialist paradise. Um, but the Labor governments of Yitzhak Rabin and Ehud Barak uh, in the 1990s, it's such a distant memory. And at the time, it, and, you know, I'm really wanting you to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I got a sense that it was security and the, you know, the Camp David Agreement and, and the Oslo Accord and, and, this, and the extending of um, seeking to really r- ratify a two-state solution and then the retaliation um, to, from the Intifada that kind of, hurt labor in the polls but that's a long long time ago and we just had a, an election here just recently and we've not talked about security at all where is labor now how does labor get back to being i mean will, will it ever happen again what can labor and broadly speaking the left regain um control politically in in, in a country that that basically it, you know essentially it founded I, I, where is the hope in this story for labor there's, there's two things that Labor needs to do, or the left, I'd say, in general, all those di- different parties to get back in power. The first is to convince Israelis that their vision of a two-state solution, of um, some, some sort of border that goes more or less along the West Bank and Gaza, and there's a state of Palestine next to a state of Israel, they need to convince the majority of Israelis that that is going to bring them security and peace. At the moment, a lot of the majority of Israelis, especially Jewish Israelis, don't believe that. Um, and so they they haven't you know they, they believe that a two state solution will put their lives in danger will cause more rocket attacks will weaken the country will mean that it won't be able to defend itself etc. You know I, I work in a peace organisation and and part of what we try to do in in Kids for Peace is exactly that question of how do we how do we show people on the other side both Palestinians and Israelis that the other side um, wants to live with them in equality because there's there's obviously a lot of hatred and racism that is taught in in schools here and and comes from synagogues and mosques and churches and all all those sorts of other places as well that says that the other side um, either doesn't belong here or that the other side um, doesn't deserve um, to live with the same rights that you do and so the question is how do you how do you change that especially when the Israeli occupation has been you know in place now for for over 50 years, and uh, and there's a lot of fear that Israelis would have that if you took down the aspects of the occupation, like the walls and the checkpoints and the permit system and all of those rules that the Palestinians need to live under, a lot of Israelis fear that that would harm our safety. And the left needs to convince, um, I guess, the population that, that, that removing those elements of, of the occupation will actually make Israel safer. I mean, that's something that's very hard to do for the left at the moment. And the second thing the left needs to do getting power is to do with the with the Mizrahim. So Mizrahim are Jews that came to Israel from uh, countries like Yemen, Morocco, uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, you know, all those sorts of places. And they overwhelmingly vote for Likud today. Even though they are still, many of them live in the periphery, they tend to be much poorer than people that live in the big cities in the middle. They still vote Likud, mainly for historic reasons about 
um, the racism of the Labour Party of the 1940s and 50s that, uh, that discriminate against them in various ways to do with jobs and um, and, and the, the Mabarot, the, the, the sort of 10 places where they lived when they immigrated. Um, and so the, there's a sort of historical legacy that, that, that a lot of Mizrahim just won't vote for the, for the Labour Party for those, for those historic reasons. Um, and even though the Labour Party have tried to run sort of Mizrahi leaders like Avi Gabay, like Amil Peretz, it just they've never sort of broken through um, with with that demographic, which you really need in order to become a a, a party of power. Um, so so Mirab, you know, she did very well, but still most of her votes come from, you know, Tel Aviv and the sort of the centre area. She she isn't really getting a huge bounce in places like Stegot or Tveria or Ashkelon or places places in the periphery that are still mainly voting for Likud, and so. For Labour to do that, they yeah they they really need to be able to get Mizrahim to vote for them, and they need to be able to convince Israelis that a two-state solution will make them safer. You've um very detailed um, analysis there, and you've actually answered my um, next question, which was you know what does make up the base of the Labour Party vote, and where do they need to go? The other question I wanted to ask you then was the demographics of Israel. How much is it changing? I mean, I, when I was over there, I was struck by the amount of um, uh, influx of um, former uh, Jews from f- the former Soviet republics that it had m- migrated into Israel. Is the is the the demographics of the country changing over time? And if it is, is there opportunities for Labor to build new relationships with new migrants that are coming in? Um, wh- where is there hope in that component? So, yeah, the demographics is very interesting. So if you look at most of Western Europe, there. Most people there are having one to two children per family. In Israel, even despite Corona, the last few years, people are having three to four children per family. So it's one; it has one of the highest birth rates in the OECD. And the main populations that are growing are the the Arab and the ultra orthodox populations. So in terms of what Labor has to do, you know, Labor in the past has sat in coalitions with um, ultra orthodox parties. And I think it will need to do that again in order to be in power because they are becoming a very significant block and it's very hard to form a coalition um, without them. Um, okay, last question before we um, uh, let you st- start your day. Um, you know, a lot of uh, folks listening to this show um, have a, um, um, a, a knowing sort of love and respect for the people of Israel, the Labor Party, the Australian Labor Party has had a great relationship with the Israeli Labor Party and it, dates back, not even to Bob Hawke, but goes back even further than that. Um, you've moved to Israel. You live there now. I, I just want to get a sense um, f- from you about the relationship that exists between our, our two great countries. So when I first moved here, I'd often compare things in Australia to Israel. So, so Australians are very polite. Australians follow rules. I mean, that was very clear in Corona, you know, Australians sort of sat in lockdown didn't really, I mean, you grumbled about it, but, you know, you didn't really have people just opening schools and businesses and, and that sort of thing en masse when the government said not to. Um, it has nice customer service, you know, people ask you, have, have a nice day and that sort of thing. And in Israel, I think a lot of people just say what they feel um, and everything is a lot more spontaneous. You know, I, I remember as a parent, like when I was in Australia, my my kids, if I wanted to make a play date, you know, I'd call a week in advance and arrange the time. And here, the kids just come home. My seven-year-old will say, "I just met a kid in school today, and let's <laughs> let's spontaneously have come over for dinner or, or whatever." So, um, so there is something there is something I think Israel can learn from Australia about following rules and having trust in government. You know, even though you didn't vote for a certain party, that you have. You, you don't feel like the health ministry is controlled by the Labor Party or the Liberal Party. You know, you follow health ministry guidelines because you follow them. Whereas here, I think everything seems to be a lot more political. Um, but I also think that the the two countries, you know, have, have a lot in common in that they want to be Western liberal democracies. And both of them have human rights issues that are, that are concerning, especially with Israel regarding the occupation and Australia regarding its treatment of of the asylum seekers and, and of Aboriginal communities as well. So so we, we're both imperfect, you know, and, and we can both learn about each other in how we deal with these struggles. And I think um, I think a greater understanding of that, you know, I, I covered the Michael Leifer case for the last 
two years, I went to every single court case, and that was also a huge strain on Australia-Israel relations um, because of the way that the court system here was was so dragged out. And I'm glad that that she is back in in Melbourne now, and that she can um, face justice for, for the alleged crimes that she committed against the girls who went to the Adassi Israel School. And I and I hope that that in the future. Um, we'll have a relationship, I guess, that's less based on sort of myth than what the two countries represent and reality. Um, and, and I really encourage Australians to, to when, they, when they're trying to understand what's going on in Israel, not just to read one news source, um, but to read multiple news sources, read, read Haaretz, read Plus 6 1J, read the Jerusalem Post, read the Times of Israel. Don't just rely on sort of one one new source because because getting that multiplicity of voices will always give you a more accurate picture of what's actually happening here. Here, here. I um during lockdown, the the second lockdown in Melbourne, the tough one, um, I uh, I would my um, partner and I would sort of in order to mentally get through the fact that we actually couldn't leave our homes. Uh, you'd start dreaming about, you know, where would we go when we finally get through all this? When would we, where would we go if we could get on an aeroplane at some point? Um, and through that process, we both actually came to an agreement, looked at each other and said, oh, we should go to Israel. And I was like, I need to get back to Israel. Like, you know, there are certain days in Melbourne where the sun shines in a certain way and it kind of feels like Tel Aviv. I don't know why I think that, but I, and I feel very nostalgic for that. Um Today was a little bit like that, actually, and maybe it was because I was about to interview you. I don't know why, but anyway, so um, that's definitely when we're allowed to get back on a jumbo jet and fly overseas, um, we will be going to the Holy Land, um, and uh, I'd like to do an interview with you face to face as opposed to over, over Zoom. And something that's also on my bucket list is to do an Israeli election, and you have them every twenty minutes, so I'm not going to miss out on that opportunity at yeah, some stage. Not going to miss on one. I'm sure. I, I, I'm sorry that my top prediction was a fifth election, but if you can, if you can get here sort of by August September, I think you'll you'll be here for the next one. I look forward to it. It's, I, it's been wonderful talking to you today. Really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come and have a chat to us. And uh, no doubt if there is another election at some point, I think we'll get you back on to give us a bit of a rundown of what's happening this time around. Pleasure. Thanks. Bye, everyone.